So as you know, um, my name is Maud and I'm doing a PhD here with Yvonne, who's, which is actually already like starting about right now. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about just uh, a part of this project, which is to do some more uh, pump up that sampling, but in the Swiss Alps, uh, for reasons that you'll find out in a few minutes. Uh, I, I came back literally from the first few work seasons like two weeks ago. So it's not as if I could present to you some fancy results as did the two past lectures before or that kind of stuff. It's just really the project as it goes as it is right now, just so that you're really into, you know. Um, so yeah, so my PhD project is going to be no more, like no surprise about the within species variation potential in the, in demographic rates and strategies. And what's important to know is that uh, it's a collaboration. It's a collaboration between here in Ireland and back where I come from in Switzerland uh, with another professor, Professor Antoine Guizan, with whom I did my master's degree. And um, and uh, yeah, so uh, my, my, my main supervisor is Yvonne Buckley here and Antoine uh, back home in Switzerland. And um, so yeah, the, what Antoine does is work, he works mainly on species distribution and on, on, on SDM, so on uh, the modeling of the leash. So what he does basically is that he builds, like the idea of an SDM, so a species distribution model, I don't know how familiar you are, so just uh, very quickly, is to build a model that's based on occurrence data in the field, uh, linked to environmental variables, like for instance, the temperature, the, the precipitation and that kind of things, to link it into a model, and then try to obtain a suitability map which can be read in two ways. What's usually done in the literature, like very often done, is just a presence absence, uh, like a predictive map for the occurrence of the species. Is it here, is it not here? Or you can read it, read it as a suitability map, which is what it is. So a uh, gradient of suitability, like is, it, is the environment very suitable, not suitable, or not suitable at all for the species at this, on, uh, at this place? And when I started speaking about doing a PhD with Yvonne here, uh, one of my wishes was to kind of bring the two approaches, bring my background into this PhD for a part of it. So kind of uh, also bring my uh, knowledge and suitability models into the demographic uh, like approach, but which I was starting brand new. Um, and so the idea was to study questions like how do populations behave at range age edges or along the suitability gradient. And a very good setup to do that is to study it in the Swiss Alps. Like the Swiss Alps is about 60% of Switzerland, but particularly in this little tiny bit, a tiny spot here, and I'm going to tell you right now why the Alps are so interesting. So first, because we know that as many, many, many species, there's a suitability gradient for the um, for for Pantagolan solata in in the Alps. I don't know what that did. Um, so at Plantago Lanceolara occurs mainly at slower elevation and then as the climate goes colder, goes with more snow, with harsher conditions, it kind of is out, like disappears, most probably at competed. We have other species of Plantago that will occur uh, from the subalpine elevations and onwards, which are Plantago alpina and atrada, and atrada you might hear of later on in the presentation. Uh, so yeah, so that was my idea to use this and like this experimental setup that is actually just an environmental setup um, to kind of use it. And also, the very useful thing is that Antoine and the Ecospat Lab have been working in the Rechab study area, so part of the Swiss Alps, which just happens to be in one of the counties. So the, the part of the Swiss Alps, which is in the counties in which the University of Lausanne stands. Uh, it has been extremely well studied for like over a decade, so we have a lot of information, which of course is very, very precious. So Elizabeth, you were talking yesterday about butterflies, so we also have butterfly inventories, for instance, so we have some other stuff we could play with at a later stage. Uh, so that was where the idea kind of came from. And now I'm going to tell you what I'm at in the project and what already exists, and I'm very happy to get any kind of comments you could have. This is a thrilling moment because it's kind of starting, so any input is very welcome. Um, so my first step, the first thing I had to do, of course, was to create my own kind of model, suitability model, like the first wish I had, was to create my own suitability model for this uh, species. So step one was to get the model, um, which I did in this way. So I had access to Jesus' preliminary results, so I was developing this in May. So what I did was to select first two, um, like what ended up being the very best model after some, some work on it was to translate the, to make a suitability model translating the occurrences uh, as a function of temperature, uh, vegetation height as a layer of meadows height, 
master index, slope, topo and topographic position. So topographic position is just an information of, of whether you're on a slope, on a bump or in a sink. Slope is the slope of the, pla of the place. Uh, moisture index would be, in theory, as um, measured by remote sensing, the potential humidity that's retained in the soil. And meters height is a layer that I had um, developed in my master's degree, which would be the, the average height of the communities, of the vegetation community, the average uh, vegetative height. So since I had it available, I thought it would translate very well into plant was ecology. Um, and yeah, so the whole thing was done uh, through an Ansible model. And I had like, I don't know how, many, how much this interests you, I'm happy to go through it if you want. Uh, we had tried also uh, several other stuff, like to use PC accesses, direct uh, access directly as Jesus has done, or to do it with multi-modeling to project something with multi-models. Um, and this was leading worse or similar results, so I just went for the straightforward one, which we could easily compare with plant popnet built model later on if we wanted. So I thought, let's keep it uh, in a straightforward uh, interpretation possibility. That's it. So once I had my beautiful model, I projected it on the, um, on the uh, study area. So this beautiful heart shape is what you were saying you know, as a part of the, of the, um, of the Swiss Alps. And I found it very, very ironic that, it's had, that it has it, this kind of heart shapes because it's kind of really where my heart lays. <laughs> so I was very happy to go back. Uh, so yeah, this is the suitability map I was ob ob obtaining shown on a hill shape. So Without surprise, Plantago is happier on, on the, in the valleys than on the top of the mountains, which is kind of expected since uh, Plantago, like this would be 3,000 meter and this would be 300 meters elevation. So obviously 3,000 meter, we don't expect a very happy Plantago. And what I did is that I divided my, uh, I divided this in a suitability, like in five strata of uh, suitability. So that were just 20% each of the, Whole uh, suitability spectrum, and I sampled a certain number of points in this uh, in each stratum. The sorry, point. Sorry, Maud, can I just ask a clarification yeah, question? Sure. The pink color is the most suitable, is that right? And the green is the least suitable. Uh, or the other way around. The green is the most suitable. Most suitable, right? Okay. And this suitable, is yeah. yeah, and this would be like the heel shape shows you kind of this is a summit and yeah. this is the valley. Okay, and then high means high elevation or high suitability. High suitability. Uh, these categories. These categories are, yeah, sorry, thanks for, for asking, yeah. because it's actually, of course, upside down, like the high elevation is the low suitability. Yeah. So the values here are the suitability, and when I'm talking about physically the mountain, I might go for, for high elevation and same height, so I'll try to avoid that and just directly say high elevation. Thanks for... So uh, those are not elevation, so it's 500, 400 and such? Yeah. No, no, this is no elevation, this is suitability. <laughs> so this, numbers, sorry, what are the numbers? They are the results of uh, the suitability model. So it goes from a zero to 1000 in theory, it's just it didn't go from 1000 to 1000 uh, in this case. It's at log odd scale, but I can't translate this exactly into what it means. Okay, that's okay. fine. But yeah. I guess that's enough of any information for other models. Um, so that would be it. And then I had my crop selections. Um, yeah, so as I said, the study is very well inventory. So these are the, the known occurrences of Plantago in the research area. And what's very important to know about those black dots is that Antoine has made a 912 uh, in inventory, like he's got, he's made a random stratified sampling of the, veg of the vegetation in the, in the area. Um, which included 912 inventories. So I had the absence and presence data for 900 sites, which I could base my model on. And also when it came to selecting sites, I, I thought, okay, I'm not going to go randomly in the apps where I thought, I think it's mainly suitable, especially for the low suitability sites. It was going to be tricky to find a site where I had Plantago in, uh, in the, the low suitability area. So I used known occurrences, but these known occurrences come from a random stratified um, sampling, so I randomly could have sampled any point, like they randomly could have sampled any point in the in the apps, and there was just a way to know where I would go. But this is kind of as random as this, as it goes. Yeah. How big is each site, and um, is the number of samples, or is it just a random sample? I have both. Like I have a brown blanket 
uh, information for the density of Plantago. These are just the presences, so it's anything from R to, to, to 2B, I think. So from, from uh, just less than 1%, just a small presence to like a third of the, of the site. Um, and the sites are done on a two by two uh, square, so that's how they do it. Two and by two meter. Yeah, two by two meters square. Okay. And was there another part to the question which I forgot? No, that's right. Okay, brilliant. So that's it. Um, okay, sorry, can you just tell us the scale on this area? Yeah, I realized yesterday night when I had my headache that I had forgotten that, so I'm sorry. The, the overall scale is, is 700 square kilometers, and the next slide you will see normally the distance. So let's just switch to it. There, 10 kilometers is that little block here. And uh, so what I had when I started, why do you have to pass my slides? Um, what I had when I started my sampling was this, the real map uh, with some points per suitability strata. So this would be the uh, low, low suitability strata, it would be the very high. This is not important. So just to show that they were randomly uh, selected out of all the occurrences I had. And I was hoping to do perhaps, I don't know, two, three um, population per strata. That would be a huge work and I was panicking. So I put myself to work. And after a lot of hard work, it ended up that I had 19 populations sampled by the end of the summer. And so in these uh, 19 populations, they are, well, regularly distributed in uh, five suitability strata. And I have the demographic, demographic data that's starting this year, and I sampled leaves uh, for SLA uh, measurements uh, on the spot. And I also went to sample the seeds, but many, many of my sites I couldn't, like uh, a su surprisingly high, but not that high proportion of the, of the, of the Sites, I couldn't get any size, any seeds or not the 10 uh, seed pots you're supposed to get for plant partner protocol just because they seem to be very, very clonal. So either because of the land use, I was missing the flowering time, which can happen when you're, when you're here for the first time, uh, or they're just extremely clonal. So this was one of the findings. And uh, I also sampled this, another leaf in each site, like another few leaves uh, in each site so that we have, so that we could have the genomic material. So Annabelle has already got, uh, has already sent a, a whole uh, suitability uh, gradient to like a, a whole transect, so five per, uh, populations to be uh, to be gen to the genomic analysis, and uh, I have extra materials in case we want to do it, and that's pretty much where I am at with the project right now. As I told you, I'm back from the field like two weeks ago, so there's not much that was done, but I managed to get uh, Jesus' analysis about where about the, the, the global range of Plantago. So this is his figure he showed yesterday with the invasive and native together, plotted together, and my sites are right here in the empty spots. So I'm actually fitting in the big picture, which is the big news. <laughs> <laughs> and it's even nicer if you look at the native range alone where I really, really fit into the spot, in, into the hole. So when we saw that, I was like, I was next to, to Jesus when this, uh, this like came out finally after her hard work. And I was like, Jesus, can you believe that? <laughs> so All those work we planned. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. So not only is it a beautiful site project because it's kind of uh, selected in a stratified way along the suitability gradient, and not only has it its own story in its own and it also tells you what happens when demographers do not choose their plots because they're nice and sexy and shiny but when they go when they ha where they have to because somebody randomly stratified uh, randomly selected a couple of points a thousand of points in the swiss apps and tell them okay that's one <laughs> let's go there <laughs> so that's so that's give me points for my within site variability prediction sorry oh i predicted earlier that there'd be as much demographic variation within sites as among sites mm -hmm. Anyway, okay, I suppose so you're not calling them all the same sites. No. <laughs> no, no the, I mean, they cover a very, I think mean, the, the question is they cover a wide range of environmental space, yeah. even though they're spatially very close together. Right. Yeah. So we, we have close geographic distance and they're quite spread out in environmental space, which is very cool. Yeah, so, yeah which is well, very cool. And this is. All the elves. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, those are squares. So the, the red shop site. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six squares, and that's and that's another thing. Like it's bioclim. Like I have much finer scale data available, but what I did just to get that and to have it comparable with his <coughs> finding, uh, this is just the bioclim layers at what did you use one kilometer square? 
uh, I guess. Yeah. Like the run, like it's it's extremely cool scale as compared to as tiny. I can go, I can get very uh, like temperature or any any kind of variables one meter square here. Wait, what? I, I could get <laughs> I could get stuff one meter square. You mean you're like, not even talking? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we we have extremely fine scale here. Okay. Like not me, but Antoine has extremely fine scale stuff, and my the PhD who supervised my master's was working on extremely fine scale stuff. So in my master's, like the the like we have five meter square things, one meter square variables. So we have very very high, uh, like the temperature peculiarly, we can really go to one meter. So so this is extremely close as compared uh, to as fine as it can go. But it's already very very neat. Like I was very happy when I saw that. Yeah, they, they look like they're on a really interesting linear gradient where you've got the correlation between temperature and precedent. So mm -hmm. they, that's really fascinating. So the turn study on um, mm -hmm. Australia has looked at one that over five kilometers gradient. So imagine you could have gone vertically up, keeping temperature constant, and very precedent, and gone uh, horizontal and kept precedent constant and very temperature. But what you've done is actually use it where you're keeping the thing constant and you're at the diagonal on there. Which is the goal that's uh, like it, it it is it is supposed to end up in a gradient because I put the temperature I, I purposely put temperature yeah. and precipitate and humidity like a, a humidity variable. And you try to separate and, that out so it's going to exactly come out. So it's yeah. just knowing that once I could see the squares. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, the squares are here, the little tiny squares. Yeah. yeah. So presumably uh, if you if you colored those by suitability they would get less suitable if they moved up that diagonal. The True, suitability for the side of occurrence would get lower as you move up that yes, diagonal. Temperature got lower. Yeah, the temperature, temperature gets higher. lower and increase it gets higher. Yeah. Most probably, yes. Yeah, yeah it's absolutely true. Actually, the line is pointing to the center of the mission. Sorry? The line of the squares yeah. is just pointing to the center of the environmental mm -hmm. niche. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the precip at the high elevation would be a snow bar, so that's not usable in the same way immediately. If I did these things automatically, I use the growing season stuff. I use the growing season. Growing season, growing season Yeah. Oh, okay. And it's not oh, precipitation. Right. It's not precipitation. Okay. It's uh, the precipitation minus the potential evapotranspiration. So a measure of what should be left in the soil. So, so what's that's actually left. The moisture indexes. Yeah. 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 We can gladly but go back. I didn't want to make like half an hour on one slide about no, the variables. <laughs> but if you, if, if you want, we can go through it. Like, I know them. <laughs> it's not the issue. No, no, I think this is fine. It just basically puts it in the context of the, the yeah. global niche. That's yeah. cool. I would just say that these are just two axes of the niche. Yeah. And yeah, there's no in one. And just to come up with the issue about snow, in general, we use special modeling. But also, even most water has many more factors. Yeah. yeah. So it would be interesting to go the other. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, let's go back to so this seems to be interesting to everyone. Um, like, I didn't, uh, in, like, we have duration of snow co co cover layers, but they were being developed, like, they were an, an uh, uh, they were on work, ongoing works when I was developing thing, this, so I did not, like, I didn't, I couldn't try to put them in. Um, I just used the I used the, actually the Plantago Bible, so the, the book that Kisses is supposed to have brought. <laughs> um, and they were actually saying that apparently it didn't affect except in case of very, uh, very outstanding events. Uh, so based on that, I just thought, thought that was enough yep. and went for it. Um, yeah, so I don't know if you have any other questions on this. If you want to spend an hour, half an hour on this, I'm happy. I like my book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just thinking that I think that you have a Bible yeah. that's radiant. By other sites that have already sampled, you can extend your gradient by collecting them into a subset as well. I didn't get that, sorry, can you repeat? Well, in the mapping of yeah. the environmental space, yeah. your Swiss Alps populations map that. Agreed, yeah. yeah. But there are other populations that come into 
Yeah. By a temperature, so you can extend your biochromatic gradient virtually by using other people's data. Yeah, I could. So obviously, yeah. my perspectives are to do that exactly. So yeah. to kind of extend, mm -hmm. that's why I stick to a very kind of interpretable uh, model. Yeah. Although I, there were other options, I won't deny it. There could have been tons of approach using PC access or whatever, but I stick to what could be meaningful so that I could then try to build something here, either comparing niche with SDM, without SDM, but anyway, with things that would mean something so that I com can compare it internationally. And, um, and anyway, the good news was that pretty much in all my attempts, I would reach the same, a very, very similar map. So kind of the, the, the where I would put my plots is kind of similar. So that's, for me, that was very important to see in the development of the, of the project. So yeah, anyway, I also wanted to thank everybody who, who helped me on the field and uh, those who helped me before that. And uh, give for your attention. Yeah, and truly how beautiful. So, so you have like different suitabilities, and you got like maybe five, five almost up to four replicates for, for suitability. So the suitability is low or high because of several reasons, yep. right? So yep. did you also stratify within reasons? What do you um, mean? So imagine like the suitability could be low because of too, like not enough water, too much water, yeah, yeah. or too hot, too high temperature, too low temperature. I, it, uh, like it would have been another option yet to stratify it through directly the climatic drivers. Mm -hmm. Very honestly, just not what I wanted to do. Because <laughs> uh -huh. I thought like we know, like there are, there have been some, already some, some studies on just the Platago's behavior on on climatic or like water drivers or this kind of uh, like gradients and I was uh -huh. like I really want to try the suitability thing like really the global thing but it's right. true there's a there's a mind shift to have like to, to accept that this is a multivariate climatic variant uh, gradient uh -huh. so if you really want to look at your map of the Alps and then just deduce you have to go through the modeling process so of course it's kind of riskier because you might have messed up with the model right. um, but it's i think it was really something i wanted to do for like to use to say okay but what means what is meaningful to this plant is whether it is under stress condition or not it doesn't really like of course it will be affected differently by different drivers but i think what really will affect its survival as a, a population is whether it's under stress or not and i really wanted to try to capture this so it's kind of the best, the bargain of this, right. of this approach. Probably would require a lot more samples to yeah. separate out all of yeah. those different variables as well, and like 19 populations. It's, it's, it's massive. And then the, <laughs> one of the questions that was petty, but like, how long did it take you to do the Two months. Easy. Easy. <laughs> Easy. Okay. I Not was super happy in the Swiss Alps, like, uh, if I bring you to back to a map, to a map. Uh, this is the Swiss Alps where uh -huh. I was working Monday Friday. Uh -huh. This is my hometown. So <laughs> this is my hometown, like one and a half, one and a quarter hours away. So, so it, it it wasn't the worst field work to have over a summer. I must yeah, yeah, good. Um, no, actually, but I was asking that because like it seems like right now we're looking at variation in vital rates. Yeah. But there's not. Maybe that's me. But there's not like a, a clear maybe. Hypothesis. Maybe we don't even need a hypothesis. It seems like we're going like we're just heading in data um, without a clear hypothesis. Other than from what I gather from your work is that if the suitability is lower, then we should have more variability. And yeah, well, there's this hypothesis that yeah. emerged out of Anna's work, one of which is um, more ver low suitability, more variability of growth in the family. And then the other one is about the, the vital rate. So that would be retrogression, so it's the only vital rate that came out of um, showing a signal of plant suitability. Mm -hmm. However, um, I, would, I wouldn't restrict myself just to those, the outcomes of that between species paper because we had relatively low power to detect the effects of plant suitability because there was few populations per species. So you may find completely different things happening within a species as opposed to between a species. In this case, in particular. So I think my hypothesis there is that climate suitability will affect vital rates and variability in vital rates. And we'll look at all of them. So right. the, the basic hypothesis was really the more constraint uh, variability, like the more constraint strategies at the range edge, mm -hmm. which could have been like 
But at some point there was this choice, okay, do I really want to have a huge amount of samples at very low suitability and a huge amount of samples at the, at the lowest, like at low suitability or high suitability and just compare the two, the two groups? Or do I want to accept that, yeah, that's my hypothesis, but I want to have a robust, like a more um, homogeneously uh, plant design so that I could also ask other questions on the road. And that's what Antoine, I and Yvonne just went for. Yes, so I don't know who was first. Fatou? Uh, are you interested in biogen samples as well? Yeah. Because the same as what I see is that if you, you could assume that February load and pathogen load are higher at the higher elevation than at, sorry, vice versa, are higher at lower elevation mm -hmm. than at higher elevation. So you could collect the GTX data and test that in the new project. So the pathogen, you say the pathogen load, for instance. Yeah. Yes, we could. We could. And the volume. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we could. The herbivory, for me, there's a big thing in this is that just because of the way the traditional agriculture works in Switzerland, in, on, on the outs, we would basically only have forest if we didn't have the grazing of the cows. That's pastures. And um, so basically where I have plants I go, I have cows that, or I have land use, but mainly what in these 19 populations, I necessarily have heavy rain because I know I have this kind of environmental uh, uh, <coughs> medio ambiente, ambiente? Ambiente? No, like the type of ecosystem, let's say, um, this type of uh, ecosystem. I have this ecosystem just because I have this kind of land use. Mm -hmm. So it's driven by the the, the, the heavy pattern. So yeah. so yeah. the like it's kind of also a circle. Yeah. Like so there's, there's, there's <laughs> variation in your grazing pressure amongst those sites. Yes. But a little bit in timing. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, there will be a lot of differences, I think, from what I can see, because some of them are mown and grazed. Mm -hmm. Some of them are only grazed. Some, depending on the elevation, like basically what the cows do, what cattle do, because it, it's different type of cattle is uh, you start at low elevations and then you go up as this as the snow melts basically and then the uh, I don't know how you call the cows that don't have baby yet and don't make milk heifers so the heifers just stay high up for two months let's say and then you go down and you take the milk cows lay it down so you have kind of this migration toward high up then the young ones that stay for two months high up and then you go down and um, and so it's, it varies depending on your elevation. The, the, the land use will necessarily vary depending on your elevation. And my sampling is kind of based on the mm -hmm. elevation gradients. So the herbivory, I think, is gonna, going to be tricky just because of that, that I will be able to get the pathogen or the insect herbivory. That would be very neat. But then there's the question of uh, what to do with the cows. And about the interaction, I found another very, very powerful thing in there is that uh, I already have from earlier on the uh, vegetation community for like for a few years before and I'm capable of doing my vegetation like my vegetation relevates myself since I know how to so I will also have the I hope to have in the next years the the whole community like the, the vascular plant community can I just stop you there and ask yeah, sure. can you ask the people online if they oh yeah sorry I forgot that okay yeah. Any other questions for me? I was just wondering about um, how it fits in with the other projects. Um, Maud and I were chatting about it the other day, and I don't think we were very clear on, you know, how many of these sites go into, say, my first paper, for example. Um, yeah. Do we treat them as normal plant pocket sites or as separate? And obviously, Maud has her PhD to do and everything. But um, just looking at the where it fits into the environmental space. If we look at just that, it makes sense to, to put them all in mm -hmm. as sites to look at the yeah. effect of environment on the genotype. For so, example, I guess the primary concern that we have <coughs> is that Maud gets three publishable pieces of work. As yeah, as mm -hmm. first author. Yeah, so that's that's the important part for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. but there's no reason why we couldn't incorporate data that Maud is not leaving as a first author into plant popnet in general, and then she would be a co-author of those yeah. papers. Just as long as that doesn't compromise her three lead author papers. Yeah. I guess I was just wondering, do I put them in for the genetic? Analysis? For the genetic, it's my answer is obviously yes. Like I'm never going to do those analyses myself. 
like never ever. Yeah. So if you can bring me some information about my sites, mm -hmm. get some papers on the way, and I get some plus on my for my PhD, I'm very happy. That's in your case, I think that's very straightforward. Mm -hmm. And yeah. for about anyone else, if you've got ideas, if you've got desires, projects, or whatever, let's discuss it. Yeah. That would be my my motto. Yeah. Like as long as I'm a PhD student, let's discuss it. And when I'm not anymore, well, that's extra data for everyone, and everybody's happy. Yeah. For for genomics things, yes, and for other things, let's discuss it yeah. case by case. Just just also to ensure that everybody has got their their project. But I'm happy with that. Yeah. Um, just one thing that I would like to add about that show, like it, like as you see, it's only six, uh, like even five squares that show up. So if you want to use them at any point, and even you for your analysis, remember that they are just super clustered. Yes, but here they're not clustered. That's what I was saying. Like on the map, they're clustered, but here they're not. You know? Here they don't look clustered, but that's why I don't want it to be just used as if it were totally normal to have 19 populations in 700 square kilometers. But yeah. we have very, mm -hmm. we have many clustered populations in Ireland or you know other areas in California, for example. I know they're big, big scales, but it's yeah, but clustering in other parts of the. Yeah, obviously, but it can be the, the geographic, like the geographic distance is meaningful for many processes. Yeah. So just yeah, bear yeah, that yeah. in mind. That's, that's, that's my that's the strength of this, frankly. It's yeah. not a problem, it's not the strength, yeah. but we need to remember yeah, to exactly. incorporate geographic distance in as well as yeah, environmental yeah. distance. Exactly. Because Lars exactly right that there are some processes that uh, the geographic distance would be very important for. Yeah. Us, which we're yeah. doing. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we just need to keep that in mind if we're using the Swiss data in the global context. Yeah, yeah. Think about the geography and how that may affect it. Yeah. Which is why it has another name, just so that yeah. you bear it in mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's it. So one of the Drop. key things, obviously, with your project is the role that was had in forming the rest of the sample mm -hmm. for the global project. So yeah. is that something that I would have anticipated you would lead off with? Or you, know, you would write a paper that did that, basically, from the PhD. Here's what this tells us if we sample this way. Yeah. And using suitability, but if you sample just as you would for ordinary plant pot plant, you might have got this different message. So I see those as different. They're almost like it's got a methodological note to it first, yeah. and really helpful for a lot of the global papers, not just the top one, but many really of the other ones that have come about by the uh, everyone sign up method. Mm -hmm. If I could just follow up on that, and then Anna Robert can help me. And um, Anna, I have a question. Yes, Anna. And that's, that's, so the methodological issue is important. We can't do plant pop net for every single species that we'd like to make climate change predictions for. But what I'd like to find out from most projects is uh, how much can we learn from looking at this you know, small geographic distance or over important environmental gradient? How much can we learn about the whole environmental niche from just that section of it? Can we extrapolate you know, from the, the part of the environmental gradient that Moss captures in her study to other areas of the niche, for example? Um, mm -hmm. Or are there things we just would never predict um, just looking at this particular part of the environmental niche? Because there are most of the studies that try and look at um, how suitability or range edges and how range affects um, population performance use this kind of design where they put plots um, up against the range edge and um, elevational gradients in particular, well, the kind of gradients as well. And they try and say something about the and variation of performance across the whole range, across the whole environmental niche, from just that very small bit of it. If we can say, yes, you can do that, you can just study that, would be fantastic, or no, you can't, or yes, it only partially works. Mm -hmm. that, that's the kind of thing that I think would be really helpful for the whole field going beyond plant hydro. Yeah. I'm sorry, Anna and then Rob. Yeah, I um, was just following up on the questions just because about the range. And you also mentioned the range, but this is a population, this ever a population which is fed basically. From somewhere, if you call the valley the center, then you would go off to the range edge. So uh, if, if there's two things here, one is testing the model concept of the unity testing at this point, and the other one is the geographic position uh, uh, of the population. You know, the physical thing, because mm -hmm. you can have this kind of aspect. Yeah. So this could be a, um, um, a very good bias to test it. Mm -hmm. but, but she has specifically looked for, I would, really, I would say that she has specifically looked for good, for suitable habitats in the valleys, and does she 
Not exactly, not in the values, but you're right. right. I, I, I looked has, for the for the niche. I mean, there's, I think she will not find the values on you want with her methodological approach. Yeah, I, I could a posteriori try to compare it with the distance. Like I could now that I have my something that's based on suitability, say, okay, where are they geographically? Like where are they on the elevation gradient? I think you have it in an extra slide. Actually, let me let me. Um, well, it, <coughs> there, there are some insights. It's not an elegant design to test that, but definitely, as is the data we have, we could use it. So I'm trying to find just this little bit of info here. Um, um, so, actually, why? Oh, okay. Let's go through everything of my. Okay, so I can't do it for some reason. Let me, do you see it on the screen? No. No, you don't. Okay, so I can't. But basically, the, the elevation is... I'll describe it. So if I have the elevation and the uh, suitability, there's some kind of hump shape. So it's not a, a straight linear correlation, but it's a very strong correlation. So I could try to take my samples uh, which have been sampled on a based on a suitability basis, and looked at where they, look at where they are, where they end up being in terms of geographic elevation, and check if there's something different. If that has a different story, I could, but it's not been designed for it. 